O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name o'er all the earth. Please stand as we are called to worship this morning. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Please join me in prayer. Holy and awesome is your name, holy God. You who are with us, no matter where we go, be it on the mountaintop or be it in the valley and everywhere in between, you are the God who walks with us and besides us, beside us and holds our hand and lifts us up. So be present this morning, O God, as we worship you, as we lift up our songs of praise, as we lift up our prayers. And as we lift up our very lives to you, in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing hymn number 481, Praise the Lord God's Glories Show. sin together, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Let us pray. O Lord, we draw near to you, acknowledging our unworthiness, and we ask you that all the sins and defects of our past services may be freely pardoned and entirely done away 
through the precious blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the promise of our faith is that whoever turns to Christ will never hunger for forgiveness. So I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thank you. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are grateful for all of you who are here worshiping with us today, and we pray that this service is going to be a blessing to you. And, for those of, and to those of you who are our guests today, we're always honored to have you come and be a part of our worship here at First Presbyterian. And we hope that if you are looking for a church home, that you would where you can serve Christ, that you would consider this church and involve yourselves in the work of the kingdom through the ministries, through the various ministries of this church. But we are so glad to have you here. We have one special guest with us who soon won't be just a guest that I want to introduce to you this morning. Neely and Robert Lane are with us this morning. Neely will soon be serving as our uh, youth pastor, and we are starting next week, if I remember right, but they are here. Would you mind just waving or letting folks see you? And uh, we are so glad to have you here, and we're looking forward to working with you in the days to come. And you be sure to give her and Robert and their children a warm First Presbyterian Church welcome. And to those of you who are worshiping with us this morning by way of television, we want to welcome you to this service of worship. Please know that our prayers are with you there, wherever you may be, as we gather here to worship and lift up the prayers of this congregation as well. A couple of announcements I want to share with you this morning. First off, school is about to start, and our Perry County Mission Committee is working to gather school supplies for uh, Perry County. And if you would like to be a part of that, we would invite you to bring those school supplies and put them in the barrel that is in Warner Hall. And we would appreciate your help in that way and grateful and grateful for it. You see, we have another rose this morning and we are congratulating and excited for at the birth of Catherine Burks Escher on July the 29th. She is the parents of Betsy and Jason Escher and the proud grandparents are Emily and Bill Deal, and I know you will continue to lift that family up in your prayers as we thank God for a healthy birth and for this new baby girl. I want to invite our children now to come up for a word to the children. Please come at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Do you see where I am? Do you see me? Do you see me? Hello. Do you know who I am? Batman, that's right. In my wildest dreams. In fact, if I were Batman, I would like to think this is what Batman would wear. Reverend Bruce Wayne. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Batman. 
Now, Batman, I gotta, I gotta tell y'all something. Batman is my favorite. Have y'all, have y'all heard of Batman? Y'all know who Batman is? Batman is my favorite. I love Batman. I have Batman shirts. I go to see Batman movies whenever they come out. I love Batman. Do you know Batman is a, would you say he's a villain or a hero? He's a hero. He's a hero. But here's the thing about Batman and all heroes. You know, not all heroes, we don't have to wear masks to be heroes, do we? Sometimes all we have to do is be us, to be ourselves. Dr. Mike is going to read you a story later on. How many of y'all have read the story of when they walked through the Red Sea? Y'all know that story? Y'all know, you've heard that story? So basically they're, they're escaping Pharaoh and the seas part and they just walk on through, don't they? They just walk on through. Now, we may not think of these people as heroes, but they are. Do you know why they're heroes? They didn't wear masks. They didn't need this. They just did what God asked them to do. And they were heroes for that. You know what? I'm going to say that each one of y'all, y'all are my heroes. Do you know why? Each one of you are my heroes. A, because you're here. And I know your parents had a really easy time getting you here this morning. <laughs> but B, because you do the things that God would have you do. When your mom and dad ask you to do something, do you do it? Heroes do that, don't they? Yeah, yeah, you do it. You just be yourselves. You be the person that God has asked y'all to be. And you do things like you're nice to your, your neighbors, to your brothers and your sisters. You're always nice to your brothers and sisters, aren't you? See, when you do those sorts of things, you don't need to wear these. You're just yourselves. You're heroes. You do what God asks you to do, and you'll always be my hero. Amen to that? Can y'all pray with me? Y'all repeat after me. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Help us to be heroes to our brothers, to our sisters, to our parents, and to you. We love you. Amen. Thanks. And as these heroes go on back to godly play or go to sit with their families, I invite all of you to stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we open your word, we pray that you will, by your spirit, you will open our eyes. Help us to see and know all the truths that you share with us here. And may it change our lives to your glory and to your honor. In Christ's name, amen. The Israelites have just witnessed the destruction of the Egyptian army. It was wiped out in front of them as they experienced the flood. And after seeing God working in this dramatic way, Moses and the, the company of Israelites broke out into a song. And that is what we'll be looking at this morning at Exodus chapter 15, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might. 
and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. His picked officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overwhelmed your adversaries. You sent out your fury. It consumed them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the, in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind and the sea covered them. They sank like lead into the mighty, in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples heard, they trembled. Pangs seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling seized the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. By the, by the might of your arm they became still as a stone. Until your people, O Lord, passed by until the people whom you required pass by. You brought them in and planted them on the mountains of your own possession, the place, O Lord, that you made your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When the horses of Pharaoh with his, with his chariots and his chariot drivers went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. And then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As the Israelites stood on the bank of the sea and saw the destruction of all of Pharaoh's army before them, without them losing a man or a woman or a child, without them lifting a finger, one of the mightiest armies on the globe at that time, was destroyed and wiped out in front of them. In an instant, the threat of Pharaoh was over. And with that experience right in front of them, they break out into a song. They begin this song by singing about the rescue that they had experienced, by what they had just witnessed. And when you look at this, you'll notice that they didn't talk about the battle between the Israelites and the Egyptian. It was between the Egyptians and God. It was all God's doing. God was the one who took all credit for this. God was the one who annihilated this army and freed his people from slavery. It was God's action and God's action alone that liberated them and set them free from years and years of bondage and slavery. And the first part of this hymn celebrates that. 
They celebrate the rescue that they had experienced because the threat of Pharaoh was gone. It was over. They would never experience it again. And they lifted up their hands in praise to God about the rescue that they had witnessed with their own eyes and the destruction of the Egyptian army that they saw. They ended it with a doxology in verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? They saw and recognized and realized for themselves that God had done a work in their midst, and they gave God all honor and praise and glory for it. The rest of the song goes from talking about the rescue that they had experienced to God's steadfast love. In your steadfast love, in verse 13, in your steadfast love you led the people whom you redeemed. That's the word from the slave trade. He's bought them back and he's taking them home. They go on a journey from this point through lands that are occupied. And while the song doesn't recount any battles that they experienced, it is a testimony to the power of God to save. And it is His steadfast love that saves them. Because we cannot forget that from the very beginning when Moses gave them God's plan, from that point on, they started complaining and whining. They were scared. They fought Moses. They debated Moses. They complained to Moses over and over and over again. And they were taken out of their homes, dragged across the Red Sea, kicking and screaming the whole way. That steadfast love at work. Because you and I would have listened to that crowd and we would have said very quickly, well then have it your way, I'm out of here. But it was steadfast love that held them and kept them. There are two things I want to bring out of this song that I think are pertinent for you and I today. First, they acknowledged the work of God in their lives. They saw the destruction of this army for themselves. But this is more than just bringing people from one piece of real estate into another. This is about bringing them in to a relationship. It's about bringing them in to a vital relationship where God is real and active in their lives. In verse 17, you brought them in and planted them on the mountains of your own possession. You brought them in. They saw for themselves what God could do. They experienced His salvation. God was leading them into a relationship with Himself. Remember how the song started, Lord, You are my strength. You are my might. You are my power. They recognized that this relationship with God would be the relationship that would sustain them. Now, would they have to learn this lesson over again? Oh yes, over and over and over again. But here they acknowledge the work of God in their lives. They see for themselves what God has done. How God has brought them into a relationship so that He is their strength and power and might. They have to acknowledge that. If they're going to be in a vital relationship with God, they have to acknowledge what He has done. They can't go through their lives day by day and forget the mighty acts of God that they have seen before them. You don't have a relationship with someone when you don't acknowledge their presence. How well would that go for you at home? Would you get through the afternoon? Hardly. 
Loving someone and being in a relationship with someone means you acknowledge their presence, who they are. You acknowledge them as a person. You acknowledge them for the gifts that they bring into your family. You acknowledge them for the blessings that they are. And here Israel is acknowledging God is their salvation. God is the one who redeemed them. He is the one who bought them back and brought them back to their land. First of all, you and I have to acknowledge the God of our salvation. We can't come here on Sunday morning and sit here and worship from 11 to 12 o'clock and check that off on our to-do list for the week and then go about the rest of our week forgetting what God has done, forgetting His salvation, forgetting His blessing, forgetting all of the things that He has given us. We will never develop a relationship with God if we confine it to one hour on Sunday morning. It has to be alive and a vital part of who we are every single day of the week. Because His blessings don't fall on you from between 11 and 12 o'clock only. They fall on you all week long. And you and I need to acknowledge that. The second thing, when they saw the army destroyed, they broke out into a song of praise and thanksgiving. They recognized that this was God's doing, not theirs. They recognized that they did nothing to liberate themselves from slavery. They recognized that they had not lifted a finger to get them to that point. It was all God's doing. And this is a song of praise and thanksgiving. Miriam caps it off by grabbing her tambourine and going through the camp of Israel, singing God's praise for all that He had done. And the women joined her in, in expressing that praise and acknowledging all that God had done. And you and I need to do that too. Developing an attitude of gratitude is vital to our Christian walk. Developing an attitude of gratitude will put life in who we are, even in the darkest of days. Being grateful for all that God has done and acknowledging it routinely and regularly will turn your life around. You feel like you're at the dead end, you feel like you're in the pits, then open your eyes and see what God has done in your life and in your midst. The hymn that I learned as a child, there will be showers of blessings. And God pours those blessings on us, and you and I need to see and recognize. I don't think this happens naturally. I don't think we just do it naturally. I think we have to train ourselves. I know I had to train my children in that. At birthday parties and other times, when somebody gave one of our boys a gift, we were standing behind them saying, David, John, what do you say? Then they would respond, thank you, good, good. Somebody give them something through the week, David, John, what do you say? Thank you. Good. You're getting it. They didn't come by that naturally. They wanted to snatch and run. They wanted to grab that gift and be gone with it. We had to stop them and train them to say thank you. When I was in high school, graduating, and these gifts were coming in, I got in kind of a whiny mode, and I said to my mother, do I really have to write thank you notes for all of these? And she said, no, you don't have to. I said, really? She said, no, you just send them back. <laughs> oh, okay, I get it. To the thank you note writing, I go. We don't come by it naturally. 
We have to train ourselves and train our children to be thankful. And you and I have to open our eyes and see the gifts and blessings that God has given us. We have to be able to recognize them and express our thanks to all that God has done. A lot of times it's just taking the time to stop and smell the roses. God has blessed us. One of the things that I enjoy doing during the week, particularly in the chapel when the lights are out, is going in there and standing in front of those stained glass windows and looking at them deeply. The detail and the artwork in those windows are absolutely astounding. Have you ever done that? And I just thank God for being in a beautiful place, for allowing me to experience the beauty and the artwork of whoever did those windows so many years ago. I mean, look at the details. You can see the strands of hair. It's not just brown glass. They've put in the strands of hair of all the people in those windows. They're not just wearing robes of different colors. You can look and you can see the creases in the robes. You can look at the tablecloth and see the pattern that is embedded into the tablecloth on the tables in the, one of those windows. And the detail in all of them is just absolutely astounding. The windows that are above the back door as you come in, are, it's a Bible verse. If you've never taken the time to look at it, it is the Bible verse that says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was a prisoner and you set me free. And if you look at the various panes across that, you can see that scripture embedded in the glass. And look at the detail because when those windows were made centuries ago, literacy was not prevalent. And if you were going to communicate those gospel stories, you had to find other ways of doing it besides handing them a book. And they put, they put it in glass. With, with such detail and artistry as I'm astounded when I stand there and look at them. And I do so and thank God for the privilege of being able to see them. He puts his blessings all around you. Whether you see them or not, they are there. God says, I let the sun shine on the just and the unjust. He pours out his blessings on all humankind in ways that so many people go through their lives never noticing, never noticing the sunrise or the sunset, never noticing when something is in bloom because all they're thinking about is their allergies. And they never experience and see for themselves the blessing that God gives. And if you want to revolutionize your Christian walk, develop the practice of gratitude of saying thank you to those people who do things for you, of being able to thank God for every blessing that He has given you. So here's your homework assignment. School's about to start. Get used to it. I want you to go home and get a sheet of paper, or you can do it on your computer or tablet if you would like, but on a sheet I want you to write one to a hundred and I want you to start writing down the things that you are thankful for. You don't have to get it done this afternoon. You can take a while if you wish. But you have to do a hundred. Don't cheat. You'll get 15 or 20 very quickly. Then you're going to struggle will struggle. And before you start, this is the prayer. God, open my eyes so I can see all the blessings and gifts you have given to me and start writing. And don't stop till you make it to a hundred. And then keep that. Put it in your Bible. Save it as a document. 
keep it. And let that become part of your prayer life. That when you are praying to the Lord, you pull that sheet out and you go over that sheet again, maybe adding to it and thanking God once again for the blessings and the gifts that He has given to you. Start with your family, your spouse, your children. You may not just want to put their names down, but you may want to put the things about them that have blessed you. Gifts that they bring into your life day by day that you maybe never even acknowledged or paid attention to, but those gifts and blessings that they bring, and you may want to list them individually. Eventually, you'll have to. And then not only give thanks to God for them, but thank those people. Thank your wife for what she does. Thank your husband for what he does. Thank your children for just being the people that they are. And watch what it will do to your life. Immerse yourself in Paul's letter to the Philippians, the letter of joy that just abounds from chapter 1 to the very end if with thanksgiving for not only for the Philippian church but for all that they had done for Paul. It's a letter of joy. You let that thanksgiving and joy permeate every aspect of your life from your home to where you work to where you go to school Ask God to open your eyes to the people that He has placed around you in those environments and help you to be able to see the ways that they bless you. From the person who empties your trash can to the secretary who does your work to the boss that you answer to, you find those things that they have done to bless you and to and to be a gift to you, write them down and tell them about it. And watch what it will do to change your life. To watch how you will do a complete attitude reversal. When you develop an attitude of gratitude and begin to exercise that and, and express it, both verbally as well as writing it down so you don't forget, Watch what it will do to change your life. I'm telling you, there are few things that can revolutionize your life like being thankful and saying it and exercising the ability to do that to God and all of those people that are around you. This song and hymn that, that was written for us here in Deuteronomy is a testimony for how you and I should see what God has done for us. Acknowledge it was God's gift to us. Acknowledge that salvation is something that He has handed to us, tied with the bow, that we didn't have to do a thing for. And tell Him thank you. Thank Jesus for dying for you. And watch what it will do. I'm telling you, it will turn your life around if you'll develop the discipline of saying thanks and the discipline of exercising the ability to do that. Because there are showers of blessings around us. And we need to take note. Did the Israelites learn this at the edge of the Red Sea and not have to learn it again? Not hardly. Any more than my children got, was told at one birthday to be say thank you for the gifts that they received. We had to tell them at the next birthday too. And the next, and the next, and the next. It is something that you and I need to learn. To acknowledge the works of God around us and to thank Him for all that God has done 
in every aspect in our life, from our homes to our work, to our leisure, to all that we do, God has blessed us. And together we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Responding to God's word read and proclaimed, let us stand and affirm in gratitude what we believe, reciting from the book of Revelations as the angels are singing their song of praise. Friends, what do we believe? Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing hymn 264, when in our music God is glorified. Please be seated. I bring before you the prayers of our congregation. Start off with some really good news that Kanyui Tongo is now at home and we give thanks to God for that uh, after spending some time in Children's Hospital. We also uh, want to give thanks to God that Denise Bauer is now at home after spending some time in DCH. Our prayers do continue for Rachel Williams, who's Ashley Mond's niece, who does remain in Children's Hospital. Also learned this morning that Tom Gorder is currently in the hospital, as is Lucille Williams, who is 
Angie Williams' mother, Angie, Angie you may know from our preschool. Uh, her mother is in DCH. We continue our prayers for Mimi Stevenson, who is Vicki Holt's mother, for Billy Acock, who is on hospice care at home, for Stephen Dufershu and Abigail Grant, who are in out-of-town rehab facilities. And we also continue our prayers for Edward Lehman, uh, whose chemotherapy had to be postponed this, this last week, so prayers for the Lehman family. And also prayers for Monty Anderson and for Mike. Uh, Monty's having a difficult time right now, and so we pray for her. And we give thanks to God, as we mentioned earlier, uh, for Betsy and Jason Escher's new little girl, Catherine Burks. For these and all our prayers, let us go to God as we pray together. We wonder as we wonder where it is you will lead us. We wonder what you will do next. For we've seen great and wonderful and awe-inspiring things. Floods have receded. Waters part. Dry lands stretch before us in the midst of the seas. And freedom calls us forth. Holy God, your work knows no bounds. Whether we are in exile or we are in the promised land, you take us by the hand and you help us up. Whether we are holding the hand of a dearly departed and recently departed loved one or hero in our own faith, or whether our own pinky is being held fast by a brand new baby. You lay your hand upon us. Whether we, if we fall asleep underneath the stars at night or to the sound of crackling gunfire in the streets, you hold us in the palm of your hand. Whether we eat from a great banquet table or if we are left merely fighting for scraps, you offer us living water and the bread of life. We wonder as we wonder where it is you will lead us. We wonder what it is you'll do next, for we've seen great and wonderful and awe-inspiring things. Even now, even in our own lives, even through the prayers of your people, which you hear lifted up for names that we've already said out loud and for those names that remind, remain silent on our own hearts. Hear us now as we pray. You, O oh God, are a God who draws close through spirit and through flesh, made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, your Son with whom you are well pleased, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Faithfulness to us. Let us, may he find us faithful as we bring God's tithes and our offerings to this place being obedient to the scripture that says the tithe is the Lord's.
Loving God, we give thanks for all that is good in our lives, for the persons, for the opportunities, and for all that you have placed within our reach. Lord, just as you fed your people in the wilderness, use our gifts, time, and talents as the manna to meet the hungers of the world in which we live. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us remain standing and sing hymn 391, Take My Life. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than all we could ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, from generation to generation, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 